I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We're talking again this morning about rightly dividing the word of truth according to the commandment given uh, in this passage. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 gives this commandment to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we've said before that the Apostle Paul was given the revelation, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the dispensation of the grace of God. He was given a revelation that was different than the revelation given by the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry as he trained Peter and the eleven. He gave them a, a, a purpose and, and uh, he, he, he gave them truth according to the program uh, that they were given uh, instruction, they were given teaching, they were given, uh, they were sent as messengers to proclaim the kingdom of heaven. And, but their uh, instruction and responsibilities that were given to Peter and the eleven were very different from the instruction and the commandments and the responsibilities and the doctrine that was committed to the Apostle Paul. So those two programs are very distinct. The program that God committed to Peter and the 11 disciples uh, who became the 12 apostles uh, and the instruction and revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Um, Peter and Paul, we've, we've said uh, recently as we've discussed uh, the two commissions, the kingdom program versus the uh, program for the church, the body of Christ, the, the program that is referred to as prophecy on this timeline behind me that was revealed since uh, the beginning of the world through all God's prophets, and then the revelation, the mystery, the dispensation of grace that was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul, and then the, uh, after the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, uh, the, the uh, dispensation of grace will be concluded at the rapture with the body of Christ removed from the earth. And at that point, the Lord will bring to a conclusion his prophesied prophetic program. And so what we're going to look at this morning is just a few quick verses. We're going to move pretty quickly through these verses to show that the, the program that was committed to Peter and the eleven was very different from the program that was committed to the Apostle Paul. Uh, the terminology, robbing from Peter to pay Paul. You've heard that expression used through the years, robbing from Peter to pay, that's robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Well, there was, the origin of that uh, phrase was probably uh, due to doctrinal discussions about what the Bible tells us that we should do as believers today. And many take their instruction from the New Testament. They just take all the instruction from Matthew all the way through Revelation, and they believe that that is one complete purpose and program of God, and blend these two different, very different programs together, causing confusion for the church, the body of Christ. Uh, Peter and Paul were not enemies. They, they, they didn't feel like they were in competition one with the other. Uh, in fact, they would have been, Peter would have been shocked to, to find people that believe that during this dispensation of grace, they were trying to follow the instruction that God gave to Peter and the eleven uh, for obedience during this dispensation of grace. After he heard about the revelation given through Paul, he would have been shocked uh, that anybody would try to follow uh, the instruction given by the Lord to the kingdom church during this uh, unprophesied uh, dispensation of grace. Um, in the book of uh, Second Peter, <clears throat> Second Peter, in chapter three, uh, Peter says in verse fifteen, Second Peter chapter three, verse fifteen, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. See, Peter's saying this information given to Paul is hard to be understood by somebody that's been uh, saved under the kingdom gospel uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and, and had their program interrupted with this 
this new revelation given to Paul. It, to them, that was hard to be understood. But notice Peter says they wrestle, they rest these scriptures given, instruction given to Paul for the church today, the body of Christ, with their own program unto their own destruction. And that's what's happened to the church today. They've mixed the, the writings of, in the uh, epistles given to Paul, as Peter says here, with the other kingdom epistles in the New Testament, causing uh, destruction for the church and confusion. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're just going to take a run real quickly through the kingdom program and a few, uh, just a few verses and see how different the program is that the Lord committed to Peter in the 11. And we're going to begin uh, reading in verse uh, 1 of Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. In the King James Bible, it's, it's written with an E, but it's the same as Isaiah in the Old Testament. So Peter, or, uh, <clears throat> John the Baptist was preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it was, it was, you could reach out and touch it. Something at hand would be like this pen is at hand. I don't have to go anywhere to get it. It's within arm's reach. So that's what they were saying about the, the kingdom for Israel. The, the time had been fulfilled as given by this prophecy uh, by Isaiah. The Lord, the king, was right there among them. The Lord Jesus Christ had been born about 30 years before this in a manger, and he was now uh, going, uh, his ministry was beginning, his uh, three years of ministry before he went to the cross. And so uh, it's, it's at hand. Notice again, verse 3, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Drop down to verse 7 now. But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What is he talking about? Here's John the Baptist. John the Baptist uh, here on the board is going to, he, he's the forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ, introducing Israel's Messiah and King to that nation. And he's looking forward and he's saying to them, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, if we fold this uh, chart over and take out the information about this unprophesied dispensation of grace that interrupted Israel's program, what John the Baptist is looking toward or forward to is the wrath to come. Seven years of great tribulation that will follow. This is three years before it's set to begin. According to the prophecies given to Israel, that time was ready to begin, the wrath to come. So uh, drop down now with me to verse 10 of Matthew 3. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Notice the fire here. It's talking about this fiery time of tribulation, and there's going to be a judgment in which the evil are cast into the lake of fire uh, at the end of this millennial reign of Christ. But there's this time of fire and judgment, talking about the seven years of tribulation. Uh, so the axe is laid to the root. He's talking about the wrath to come, cast into the fire. He says here in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist speaking unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. What's that talking about? Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2. After the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, here uh, the Lord goes up. And then at Pentecost, Acts, Acts chapter 2, he baptizes. They're identified with together. The believers are identified together with this baptism of the Holy Spirit. No water involved. It's a baptism that's a dry baptism, and it's that which the Holy Spirit uh, enters into them. And they have these, the, uh, the disciples have these miraculous powers, and they have the ability. It's a reversal of the, of the confounding of the tongues that God uh, accomplished at Babel. You remember at the Tower of Babel, they were all trying to build that tower, and God stopped the building of the tower. They were trying to reach the heavens with their tower over there with their one world religion. Uh, under Nimrod, 
And God stopped the progress of all these people because they, they all spoke the same language, they had one religion, by making them speak different languages. Well, at Pentecost, there's a reversal of that. It's a sign of the kingdom. It's something that Joel prophesied that they would be able to do. Now, uh, look at, uh, let's see, did we read verse 11? Yes. Uh, look at verse 12. Uh, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and, I'm sorry, verse 11. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So you have the uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost at Acts chapter 2. But then this is the baptism of fire for Israel to go through, the seven years of tribulation, the wrath to come. So Israel, when they were looking forward in their program, they were looking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Pentecost, and then immediately to follow the wrath to come. And then the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. That was Israel's purpose and program. We'll look at a few more verses. Turn now to... Uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Peter uh, was in charge of the rest of the 11 disciples. He was given the authority in Matthew chapter 16, the the passage we're all familiar with. Look at um, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon this profession, this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on the earth, thou shalt bind on the earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Think about the authority that Peter had uh, with them, uh, that they were, uh, you know, he, he caught them in a lie, that they didn't give all the results of them selling all their property. They didn't give it all to the church. And they said that they did, but they held back some. And so he, they were questioned and they fell dead. There was this ability to have knowledge. There was this power that Peter had as leader of the 12 And uh, so there's no dispute or question about who had the most authority among the 12 disciples. It was Peter. Uh, Go with me to Acts chapter 19. He was the leader, Acts chapter 19. And notice there were 12 disciples. That's important too. Why is, is the number 12 important for the number of the apostles in the kingdom program? Well, there were 12 nations, or Israel was divided into 12 tribes, one nation and 12 tribes. Uh, Look at chapter 19 and verse 28. That's the significance of 12 disciples for 12 tribes of Israel. You remember uh, Jacob had 12 sons. Um, And and so Israel has 12 apostles in their program. Look at verse uh, 28. Um, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory. That's talking about his second coming over here in the kingdom. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, many believe the Apostle Paul replaced Judas. And that's just not good Bible understanding. If you read Acts chapter 1, you see that they cast lots and Matthias replaced Judas not Paul, but a lot of people will believe, will tell you that Paul was the 13th apostle. He was, he was along with the 12 and they were all doing the same ministry. And Paul was the one that went primarily to the Gentiles and then, and the other disciples to the Jews. But again, that, that's not supported. Paul never numbers him with, with the 12 and it doesn't make sense. You have 12 thrones, you have two different programs. You have two different purposes. Peter uh, is, is in charge, and the purpose, uh, what their hope is, and what they're looking forward to, again, is after Pentecost, this time of judgment, time of the wrath to come, a horrible time of judgment that you'll read about in the book of Revelation. But immediately following that, the Lord returning, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That purpose and program Uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is different from the revelation given to the Apostle Paul, the hope and purpose and program for the church, the body of Christ. Go with me to chapter 24 now of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel 
of the kingdom that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Uh, the, see, the end is what they're expecting to come. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time the wrath to come, uh, the seven years of tribulation. So again, the Lord is telling them in these very last times for them, uh, the gospel of the kingdom, uh, after the rapture of the church, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached again. Not the gospel of grace, not the gospel that Christ died for our sins that's given to all nations today for the obedience of faith and salvation. But it will go back to the, the kingdom gospel upon this rock, the profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, drop down now to, uh, but that's talking about the end coming. The kingdom saints were trying to, uh, their hope was to be able to walk into the kingdom after they went through this time of tribulation and wrath. To endure through this tribulation to be able to live and walk into, alive into the kingdom was their hope. Uh, enduring till the end. There's a lot of mention in, in the Hebrew epistles. Uh, after Paul's 13 epistles, the book of Hebrews begins the Hebrew epistles, Hebrews through Revelation. There's a lot in there that believers will look at those verses and confuse with us today thinking that we should, uh, our, our, that we'll, you know, they'll take the doctrine in Hebrews through Revelation and apply it to themselves, that we have to endure to the end to be saved. And that's just, that's not recognizing the literal meaning. They're, in, they're, uh, they're continuing to the end of the tribulation wrath to be saved into the kingdom. That's their hope. And it's a different, it's different. You can't apply that as doctrine today. Today, if you're saved, it's because you trusted Christ died for your sins. You don't need to continue to do any religious deeds or acts in order to keep salvation. Salvation is by God's grace through faith alone. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We have an assurance of our salvation because we're, we've been identified together with Christ and made righteous in Him. The message given the gospel today, the gospel, the grace of God. But uh, look with me. Uh, in verse 21 of Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, ever shall be. Nor ever shall be. So this is this, this uh, expectation for the kingdom saints to go through the wrath. Their, their expectation was to go through this time, horrible time of wrath upon the earth, immediately after the, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were preparing to go through this time of wrath. They weren't looking for the rapture to come and save them from that wrath. That hope was given uniquely to us today, the church, the body of Christ. Look at verse 29 of Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fit, fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of, of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That matches Isaiah chapter 60 and chapter 61, where the Gentiles will bring all the Jews, the little flock, to uh, to, to where their Messiah is at the second coming, and they're going to inherit that land that God had promised to Abraham and to their fathers. So that's, that's talking about that day. That's Israel's hope. Uh, Israel's hope um, was uh, first wrath. They were, gonna, they were expecting wrath and judgment. And then they were expecting the second coming of Christ, him to return as he does in Revelation chapter 19, that time of judgment and war, to set up his kingdom. And then they're looking at this kingdom reign of Christ on the earth, which is a thousand year reign until the new heaven and the new earth, and, and then it'll be eternal. Uh, so go with me now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So they're, the kingdom saints are expecting wrath first, the wrath and judgment of the tribulation period, then the second coming of the Lord, and then the kingdom that had been prophesied since the foundation of the world. 
Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What's he talking about in verse 1? He's talking about this, this the rapture where the Lord comes in the clouds first that uh, you read about a couple chapters before that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And you read about it in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the mystery that was given to Paul about the catching away the church. So Paul says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him at the rapture, that you should not soon be shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. What's that a reference to? The, the, sec, the, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ includes his tribulation period and his return to set up his, his kingdom. So those events are going to follow, Paul saying, the gathering together of the church unto the Lord in verse 1. Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, this, the day of the Lord's wrath, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of, per, of perdition. When does that happen? That happens in the middle of the tribulation week when, this, when the, uh, the, the Satan himself enters into the Antichrist. The Antichrist suffers a deadly wound. Uh, he dies. He's reincarnated. He's resurrected by Satan incarnate, Satan indwelling uh, the body of the Antichrist. And that's when the worst time of, of the tribulation period will be. So, Paul's saying, don't be shaken or troubled by fear of this happening because I've already written unto you and given you information that God has saved you from this time of wrath. Look at verse 4, uh, talking about this uh, Antichrist and the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders, and so forth. For time's sake, we're going to stop there, and I'll just say, verse 7, the mystery of iniquity doth already work in Paul's day. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The he that Paul's talking about is the church, the body of Christ. That's what prevents the Satan from being able to, uh, and, and, and the prophetic completion of the prophetic time of judgment upon the earth by the Lord against these nations that are rebelling against him and trying to put to death the, the Jewish believers here during this tribulation, time of tribulation, is the church, the body of Christ. Once God's purpose is accomplished in this dispensation of grace, then he'll allow that program, that prophetic showdown between God and, and the Antichrist and Satan and this whole battle that takes place for the sons of men on the earth and his and the completion of all the prof promises that God gave to the nation of Israel in this kingdom, what holds that back is the church today, the body of Christ. Go with me to, I want you to look at a couple of verses. Hold your place here in Thessalonians. Go to Romans chapter 1. Now, Paul's program, the, the purpose and program that God revealed through the revelation of the mystery, the dispensation of grace, Ephesians chapter 3, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, the revelation, uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The purpose and program God revealed through Paul for the church, the body of Christ today, uh, begins here in the book of Romans. And we're going to look at verse 1. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Um, drop down here, verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Notice God's official attitude revealed through Paul to the world today. Grace to you 
and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does not warn the church about this time, imminent time of wrath and judgment that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't hear that term given by the Apostle Paul. Because Paul is, it's revealed to Paul that God interrupted Israel's program. The wrath isn't going to come yet. First, God's going to accomplish his purpose with the church, the body of Christ. And during that time, his official attitude toward the world is grace and peace. We're his ambassadors as, be, as believers today, in the world today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God is reconciling, calling all the people in the world to himself through this gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, that Christ died for the sins of all men. And then after this time, will the wrath and judgment come? Now, now notice here, uh, go to chapter 5 of Romans and verse 8. Romans 5, 8. But God com commendeth his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. Notice verse 9. We shall be saved from wrath through him. What's that shall be saved? What's that salvation? We're saved from this wrath and the time of the prophesied judgment of God, the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years of tribulation, this, the wrath to come. We're promised God has saved us from that with the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, go with me uh, now back to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. I know we're moving fast, and bear with me. We only have a couple minutes left of this, uh, this morning. Uh, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of Paul's epistles, the letters of, start with the word Paul, and that grace and peace salutation is the official salutation of God to the church today or to the world today during this time of amnesty when he's holding back the wrath for this dispensation of grace. Now I want you to, to notice um, in, in verse 10, at the end of chapter 1, he says, he mentions that the church is, wait, is to wait for his son from heaven, whom he's raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So for the church, the body of Christ, we're not looking for this time of wrath and then the second coming to set up his kingdom on the earth. Instead, we're looking, our hope is, the catching away of the church to be saved from the wrath to come. Complete different purpose uh, for the church today, the body of Christ. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord at his coming? So we're not looking at for the second coming. We're looking for the coming, like he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, remember verse 1. We're looking for the catching of a way of the church to be with the Lord, to be delivered from the wrath to come. Look at uh, chapter 4 now of 1 Thessalonians, and we'll read in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others, what? Which have no hope. We have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's going to bring them at the rapture. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord in the clouds shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort to know that you don't have to dread living through this horrible time of tribulation. But that hope is unique to the church, the body of Christ. Peter and Paul had two very different messages and programs committed to them. And they would, they would have been really surprised to, to know that people would try to confuse those programs for the church today. Let's bow with a word of prayer.